Good morning or good afternoon, grade threes. It's Mrs. Weens here again, and I'm excited to read to you. Um, you might think I look a little different again today. Today I'm wearing a lot of makeup. Um, I don't know if you can see. You can see I have green eyeshadow on, and I have a lot of black around my eyes, and I have a lot of black here, and I have some red lips, and that is because in ancient Egypt, um, they believed that wearing a lot of makeup uh, meant that they were royals and that um, they were very important. And remember, we've talked about um, ancient Egyptians not ever wanting to look old. And so they believed that if they wore a lot of makeup, they would look young and beautiful and powerful and they'd be important people. So typically, they wore green on their eyes. It's green eyeshadow. They wore a lot of black around their eyes, like much more than what I'm wearing. Um, and the way they got the black is they would um, <clears throat> grind up ores that they had that were local, and they would uh, grind it up as fine as they could, and they would make charcoal out of it. They would take that charcoal, and they would dip a, a stick and then they would rub it around their eyes. So it would be quite thick that they would put it all around their eyes. Um, they also would take green, anything green. So any leaves or grass or anything that they would find that would be green. They would smush it all together and then they would put that on top of their eyes. And I'm going to tell you a really interesting fact. It wasn't just ladies that wore makeup. The men wore lots of makeup too. Remember we talked about the men wearing jewelry um, they had a lot of rings and earrings. Well, they also wore a lot of black and green uh, makeup. Um, they would take berries, any local berry that they could find. They would smush that up and they'd rub it on their lips so their lips would look really red. So I know I look very silly to you, but I want you to remember that in ancient Egypt, uh, makeup was very important to them and uh, they wore a lot of it. So you probably remember how silly I look and that's good. I want you to remember that. So I'll continue reading our book today. Um, I'll read chapter five and six today. Um, it talks about, so uh, our last our last chapter we read was about uh, King Tut dying. And we're not sure how he died, but remember um, scientists found that he had a broken leg. And some people think that he died of a, a blow to the head. We're not 100% sure how he died. But he died very young. Remember around 18 or 19 years old. So this part of the book is just what ancient Egyptians believed. It's not what most of us believe, but um, this is what the ancient Egyptians believed. And um, so you don't obviously have to believe it, um, but this is, I guess, the reasoning and the thinking behind what they did with uh, King Tut's body. Okay, of course, Tut had no way of knowing that he would die young. Nevertheless, he'd already started planning his tomb before his death. So if you have looked in your uh, papers that we've sent home, we talk about tombs and we talk about pyramids. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about that later uh, on another day. But the reason we had pier they built pyramids was because that's where they buried the royal people. So the really important people. That was their, like, you know, we maybe put people in a casket and they don't. They would put them in these huge, massive pyramids and they would put their body in there Um to keep their body safe. Okay, so while he was still alive, he was planning his tomb. So those were tombs and pyramids were very important to ancient Egyptians. You might ask why. Ancient Egyptians believed in an afterlife. They believed there was life after death, just like there's life on earth. They believed after they died, there was another life. In fact, they believed that life was even better than their life on earth. So just like us who believe that um, heaven is better than here on earth, right? Because we know we're going to heaven and we're with Jesus. They believe they had a better life too. The journey to the land of dead was, was a difficult one. Not everyone was allowed to live there. A special book had magic spells that helped a person reach the land of the dead. The book was called The Book of the Dead. And so it just talks about what they believed happened. Every person, even the pharaoh, had to pass a test. In the underworld, his or her heart was put on the side of a scale. So what happens to ancient Egyptians when they die? 
um, the really important ones become mummies, if you've heard of that, that word before. And what they do is they take different parts of their, the bo- um, parts of your body. So they take your brain and your heart and your, like, they take that stuff out of your body to preserve your body. Um, if a person had led a good life, the heart would be lighter than a feather. That's what they believed. Do we, do we think that's possible? We know that the heart is pretty heavy. It's a big muscle. So would it ever be heavier, lighter than a feather? And that meant the person could enter the land of the dead. The land of the dead is where the person's spirit would continue to enjoy the same pleasures they had before. Eating, drinking, hunting, playing games, and going for boat rides. A tomb was not just a resting place for the body. It was like another home, filled with absolutely everything the person could, would need or want in the afterlife. Of course, poor peasants or people did not own many things, nor could they afford these large fancy tombs. Often poor people were just buried in the sand, but a royal tomb had many rooms, all of which were filled with that person's treasures. So remember earlier we talked about um, what King Tut, what was found in his tomb. There were some games that was found, that were found. There was some gold that was found. So they buried you with all of your important things. The tomb of Tutankhamun was very small for a pharaoh. It had only four rooms. That's because it was meant for someone else, probably a member of the court. But when, when Tut died, his own much grander tomb was not ready. So they were building him one, but he was so young, they didn't think he would die that soon. So his wasn't ready, but they still believed he needed a tomb. There was no choice but to bury him there. The largest tombs of pharaohs are the three pyramids of Giza. Now, um, I sent you some links that you can look up um, on Google Earth. So if you want to um, Google pyramids of Giza, that will show you exactly where they are and what they look like. And those were the biggest pyramids, the biggest tombs built uh, for the pharaohs. And they're still, they're still there today, so you can go take a look at them online. The huge statue of the Sphinx is there too, watching over the pyramids. So they believe they built a big statue like this, it's the statue of Sphinx, and they believe that would protect the tombs and the bodies in there. The pyramids were built long before Tut's time, more than 1,000 years before. The biggest pyramid belonged to a pharaoh named Cheops. It took approximately 100,000 workers 20 years to complete. The body of Cheops was placed deep inside in a secret chamber. So you know how we said there's many, many rooms? Well, this one, there were many rooms, but there was even a secret room, and that's where they placed his body. In ancient times, people knew that treasure lay buried with the body of the pharaoh. Unfortunately, the pyramids were looted. So that means people would, like, in the night, or they would try to break into these pyramids to steal stuff because they knew pharaohs were buried with all their treasures. Robbers made off with objects meant for the pharaoh's afterlife. Pharaohs who lived later decided to build secret tombs to keep the robbers away. The tombs were underground hiding places. They had all sorts of traps so that the robbers couldn't get the stuff. Some tombs had stone blocks placed above the entrance, so these stone blocks were so heavy that no one could move them. If the door was opened, the stone would fall and kill the robber. Inside, there were false rooms to confuse robbers. And if certain floor tiles were shaped, were stepped on, they gave way, sending robbers down, falling down, and they would die. So kind of like these movies that we've seen sometimes, right? These tombs are filled with traps to catch the bad guys. But all the planning and all the traps did not stop thieves. Somehow they managed to find these secret tombs. They broke into them and made off with all the treasures and the riches. Before Howard Carter found Tut's tomb in 1922, people thought every single tomb of a fair of pharaohs had been opened and robbed. That was not Carter's discovery. It was much more of, of an important event. There always had been legends about the fabulous treasures of the pharaohs. Now there was proof. The legends were true because he found these treasures. Chapter 6. Mummy Making. 
So I've talked a little bit about it. This we'll talk a bit more. Food and furniture, clothes and jewelry. They would all be used and enjoyed in the afterlife. But the most important thing a person needed after death was his or, or, or her body. They believed that the person's spirit returned again and again to its body. So the Egyptians learned how to preserve a dead body. So pre preserve means just keep it um, in a good condition. They wanted to keep it from decaying. They wanted it to last as long as possible. What they did was dry out the dead body. They turned it into a mummy. Over the centuries, the ancient Egyptians be became better and better at making mummies. Right after he died, Tut's body was ferried, so that means it was brought by a, with a boat, across the Nile River. Their priests were waiting. Their job was to make his body into a mummy. From start to finish, it took about 70 days. First, the pharaoh's body had to be cut open. This was so organs inside could be removed. The Egyptians believed that the heart was the seat of thought and wisdom. Tut's spirit would need his heart in the afterlife, so it stayed in his body. But the priest removed his lungs, liver, stomach, and intestine. Each was put in a special jar. So they had these jars, and they had them labeled. So they would say stomach, lungs, intestines, and so that you knew which part you were putting in there. Um, later on, these jars were placed inside Tut's tomb along with his mummy body. The Egyptians didn't think a person's brain did much of anything. So with a thin hook that went up through the nose, so they put a hook up through the nose, they scraped out the brain. So they put this long hook up there, it would go up into your brain, and they would pull pieces of it out of your nose. And then they threw it away. They didn't keep the brain because they didn't think it was important. Little did they know, right? After this, Tut's hollow body was ready to be dried out. The priest called, used a salt called natron. For about 40 days, Tut's body lay packed in natron, or natron. Slowly, the salt dried out the water from the body. The skin began, became tough and dry, like leather. To keep its shape, the body was stuffed with scented rags. Then it was ready to be wrapped in yards and yards of fine white cloth. The priest said prayers as they wrapped up the pharaoh's mummy. The wrapping took 15 days, so it was a very long process. The priest placed little good luck charms in between the layers of cloth. Many of the charms were made of gold and pretty colored stones in different shapes. Some were heart-shaped, some called scarabs, looked like beetles. Still others looked like tiny eyes. They were meant to keep the evil, evil thoughts away. Once his body was wrapped up, the cloth layer was coated with something like glue. So he's all wrapped in white linen, and now they put glue over top of him. When it dried, the wrapping became hard, like a shell around a mummy. So it's kind of like if you've done paper mache before. You put this glue paste over top of your, your form, and then you leave it, and it dries, and it gets really hard. Now Tut's mummy was ready for his funeral. And that's it for today. Um, I hope that you're working on your ancient Egypt books and you're learning all kinds of really neat things of how different uh, people lived. And I just want you to remember, even though it's very different than how we live and what we believe, it's still okay to, to uh, learn about it. We're not saying that you have to believe in any of it, but it's just different. Um, it's just a different life. And that's how how people did things how many thousands of years ago, how the ancient Egyptians did them. And it's kind of interesting to learn. Um, I'm also going to post another challenge for you today. So I will get that ready and post it right away. Hope you have a wonderful day.